From the College Football Hall of Fame in Atlanta, Georgia, this is Campus Lore Live presented by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. I'm your host, Drew Butler, joined as always by my co-host, Aaron Murray. Special guest this week, quarterback of the Atlanta Falcons, Matt Shaw. Matt's a 15-year NFL veteran, a two-time Pro Bowler. He was also the 2009 NFL passing leader and Pro Bowl MVP, and of course, University of Virginia alumni. First off, big upset. Virginia takes down Miami. Did you watch that game? I did watch it. I was glued to it right after we got done our meetings this past weekend. Went right up to the room to tune in because I knew it was close and I had a little thing with Matt Bosher, our kicker, being a hurricane uh, himself. So uh, it was exciting. It was a big win for us. You know, prime time at home, uh, big for the program and what Bronco Mendenhall is building. What would you say is a bigger upset, Virginia football knocking off a top 25 team or UMBC knocking off number one ranked Virginia basketball? Oh, March man, you got to go there with that one. I mean, <laughs> definitely the basketball, all definitely times. UMBC. I mean, no, of course. That's great. Um, obviously, no shots fired. Virginia, big time win. Matt, <laughs> thanks for being here, man. Obviously, a great quarterback sitting next to another great quarterback and Aaron Murray. And it's been fun to watch college football this season. A lot of great play from the signal callers all across America. Off the bat, which college quarterback have you most enjoyed watching this season? I got to go with Bama's uh, Tua. Uh, I mean, what he's doing coming in after last year's uh, national championship game and just setting the world on fire uh, so far this season. I mean, it's hard to stray away from what he's doing there. I want to hear what you have to say about this, but Aaron, I'm going to ask you this question as well. The transition going from college quarterback to NFL quarterback, I mean, it is the most position, most important position on the field at any of level of football. You've done it. Matt Schaub's done it as well. What would you say is the most important thing getting that transitional success? I think it's, it's understanding that it's going to get a lot more complex, and, and you've seen a lot more than me. You watch college football now, and it's it's hard covering games. I look at it, it's your base cover two, cover three, cover four, your usual blitzes, and you get in the NFL. I mean, you have all week these def defenses to prepare. It's exotic, it, especially third down, red zone. They start coming up with crazy designs. So it's that preparation during the week. You got to take it up a notch because the focus is that much. The speed's there, the size there, and like I said, how complex those defenses are. And if you're off just a split second with your eyes, that's when you see the interceptions. That's when you see quarterback holding the ball too long in the pocket, getting sack, strip sack, all that good stuff. So it's, it's bang, bang, man. Yeah, you got Josh Allen, Sam Darnold, um, Baker Mayfield, mm -hmm. a couple of, I mean, Lamar Jackson's been getting some burn in Baltimore. Yeah. How are these guys able to do it? How are they able to get that success so early? Well, I haven't really watched in detail a lot of their games, those guys, but like Aaron's saying, it's, it's the preparation during the week. It's studying the film, studying what the opposing defense is going to show you, the situational football and being aware, you know, when you're in the red zone, not taking a sack to knock yourselves out of field goal range, being smart on third down. I think it's also coaching. You know, you got to understand your guy, understand where his strengths are, where your, uh, your receivers, your tight ends, what's going to give your team the best chance to succeed. And don't ask them, them to do too much. Don't ask them to play out of their comfort zone. If you can take care of your players and stay on schedule, you're going to have success. And I think that's where those quarterbacks are finding success is the guys around them are making plays and the coaches are helping. Well, I, I love that because it's true. I mean, there's a reason why these receivers are pros too. I mean, they're legitimate guys. And I think you have right. to have, you know, sometimes you look at defenses and you're like, man, this defense is awesome. Sometimes you got to look at your own guys and say, I got a great tight end. I got great For receivers. Sure. I got a great old line. I got to trust them that they're going to go out and make plays. So I think right. that trust too with your players and your teammates is something they learn because it's always great. You watch film or call it pro football all the time. You're like, man, I'm going against J.J. Watt this week, or I'm going against <laughs> yeah. DB. And sometimes you could psych yourself out, but like you can't you get have, mystified. Yeah, exactly. You can't get mystified by what the other team yes. has or what they're doing. All these guys standing up, who's the bigs, who's the line going to block, and then you forget all I'm running is a curl flat yep. and let's just read the flat defender and make the play. Mm -hmm. um, you got to see through all that and just let your natural ability come out. I can say from experience, I mean, being in the NFL and in college, guys who have a lot of success like these two, they're the first ones in the building in the morning. They're the last ones out in the afternoon. They are putting in the work, not only leading up to every single game week, but during the off season. I mean, quarterbacks really make the machine go, so I've got a lot of respect well, you know for what, you guys. And you know if a punter is good or not, it's their golf game. And Drew, <laughs> one true. of the best, I mean, his short game <laughs> is phenomenal. So you want to judge, you know, quarterback based on time spent. 
in the in the locker room in the film room, I think of punters time spent on the golf course, getting that touch. Now where's the handicap? Where's the handicap? That? That's Drew's handicap, <laughs> pretty low. That, might be, that might be the nicest thing you've ever said about me, man. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Okay, so what would be your best piece of advice for a rookie coming in, not only before the season starts, but if he just got drafted, now he's in the building, what's yeah. the first thing you're telling him? Get in there and do the work. Get to know your guys. Jump right in. Start watching film. Start getting in the playbook. Uh, be all in. You know, don't go in saying a lot, talking a lot. Just go in and do your work. Show the guys that you're the leader, that you're going to go in, that they can count on you. And just show that every day. Be the same guy. Don't get too high, too low. Um, and, and the rest will take care of itself. But if you get in there and you're talking a big game and, you know, Guys are going to see through that. They're not going to follow you. They're not going to, you know, be in your corner. What you want to do is just get in there and be one of the guys and go to work. Absolutely. So with having 15 years of experience now, and Aaron, I'll ask you the same question. What would you tell yourself, knowing what you know now, as a rookie being drafted out of Virginia? Uh, a lot of the same. I mean, it, just be patient. Take advantage of your opportunities. You know. It, everybody's situation is different, what team you go to, For what's sure. your situation at your position, and you just got to stay patient, just go to work, and um, when you do get that opportunity, you got to take advantage of it, because at this level, you only get so many. No doubt. Aaron, what would you say? I think you got to block out the outside noise. Like you said, you got to yeah. stay focused on what matters. I think in today's world with all the, the social media, then all the advertising, I mean, if you're a first-round pick, you're doing commercials, you're yeah. going to this event, to that event, and this girl's hitting you up on Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> I, you just, it's tough because there's only so many hours in the day. And if you want to be great, like you said, it starts in the film room. It starts in the practice. It starts doing those little things, the extra yeah. stuff to make you great. But then you have to worry about, too, like I said, about going to this dinner and then sure. this commercial shoot all day Monday. Right. So at some point, you got to push that away and say, hey, I, if I want all this success off the field, I better produce on the field. So I got to maybe... Maybe push this to the off season. Let me focus on the film room now. So that's the hard thing of, of getting your schedule together, making sure you're doing all the right stuff when it is the season time. No that's doubt. A good point because when I came out of college, there was no social yeah. media. There's <laughs> barely an internet the when I came out. So it's it's a whole different ball yes. game nowadays. No, you're totally right though. Blocking out the noise, and I think a thing that goes in with that, if you're in the NFL or even a, a high-profile college football player, you got to believe in yourself, right? Block that outside noise out. Understand that you're there for a reason, and if you work hard enough and trust the guys around you and do your job, things will work out. Speaking of believing in yourself. Let's go to Believe It. This is the Believe It section where we state what we believe to be true in college football. Believe It is presented by GEICO. You won't believe how easy it is to switch and save hundreds on car insurance with GEICO. Believe it. All right, I'm going to go to you first. Now, we could talk about how many times I've been right on Believe It throughout the past seven weeks. Very so rare. I'll give you Very an rare. opportunity. State what you believe Just to be true in college football. hang your head on Tennessee football. right now. And tell me what you believe right now. I believe right now in college football that Alabama is going to bench Tua. I think okay. they have to. I think yeah. you got to bench Tua, rest your, your, your stud for the next couple of weeks, get him ready. Dealing with the knees. Because spread. I believe, and I think I said it last week or maybe the week before, LSU is going to make him play four quarters. All right. I, like I believe that. that. So he needs to get rested. He needs to be healthy. He needs to be 100% because if Jalen's a starting quarterback for Alabama versus LSU, if something happens, if they play Tua, he gets banged up again versus Tennessee. LSU could upset Alabama if Jalen is the quarterback. Their defense is that good. They could shut them out. Absolutely. Matt, what do you believe in college football? I'm going to go with my Cavaliers. i got to say that they have a shot at knocking off Virginia Tech this season. Right. First time since 2003. Wow. I like, it. I like that. Yeah, that'll be a good game to yeah. watch. Absolutely. Yeah. Bronco Mendenhall's got those guys playing up in Charlottesville for sure. My believe it, and I'm going to go with it right here. I believe a head coach on the hot seat is going to get fired before the season's over. I think there's way too much going on in college football now, especially with that early signing period in December. If things aren't going in the direction that you want them to go, and we're going to get into which coaches are on the hot seat later on in the show, but you've got to make swift action immediately to save yourself on the recruiting trail, get a new message out to some top guys, and try to fix what's wrong at your program immediately. So where is it going to be? I don't know, but I think a high-profile coach will get canned before this 2018 campaign is so over. So are you teeing up your answer for later? Is I will. that what you're it's, doing it's right now? It's just a broad spectrum, oh, okay. so then I can just 
swing so at the hundred and twenty, the, the 120 <laughs> Division One program. Yeah. Someone's getting Someone. absolutely. We'll talk about a couple of those coaches though, and one this of them he's may surprise you. Right. One of them may surprise you. But speaking about what's going on in college football, let's recap what went down in Week Seven, and there was total carnage within the top 25. Teams were going down left and right and I know the college football playoff rankings are two weeks away but already a lot of implications into what teams will be in that top 10. So what was the most surprising loss of the weekend? We all know that I called the Tennessee upset you did call Tennessee of upset. Auburn. What was your most upset? surprising loss. I got to go with Michigan State over Penn State right now. You look at Michigan State the way they started the season off it's been just really hot and cold and I don't even know if hot is there. It's been cold and, and lukewarm really for this football team. A team that returned 19 starters, the working at quarterback, tremendous dual threat guy, and they just have not been great this entire season. And then Penn State, I know they had the, the, the big loss to Ohio State, but I thought they still played a really good football game. And, and it's just unfortunate Ohio State won that one. So I got to go with that one. I was not expecting Michigan State, like I said, the way they've played the season, to go in there to a pretty good Penn State team, a lot of confidence so far this season, and win that ball game. Absolutely, Matt. Surprising loss, big time losses last year. Yeah, time. I'm going to say the Georgia Bulldogs. Yeah, you know, going into LSU. Obviously, I know they're a good football team. I know that they're going into hostile environment against you know one of the top programs in the country. But with the expectations for the season and what a loss there does to them at this point in the year, you know, it's going to be it's going to be tough sledding to get back. But I think you know, just like for Georgia, it's devastating for their season. It's huge for LSU going forward. But uh, I would say the Bulldogs going and losing down there in Baton Rouge was uh, the biggest upset. Absolutely, my biggest upset was West Virginia getting blown out by Iowa State in Ames. I know Ames is a tough place to play, but you and I sat here last week, talked about Will Greer, talked about West Virginia yep. having a favorable schedule in the Big 12. Maybe, possibly, they could make some noise later on in the season for that top four college football playoff standing but man they took did it on the chin. Did you see I was they had some sweet unis though all black. Those yeah, were you nice. always they were nice. Those you were got the, the you unis go were sweet. You turn out I was like oh. Well and Iowa State is that uh the trap game for the Big no 12 doubt. right now. Right? Oklahoma gotta, State goes out. down they go down yeah. as soon as they put Purdy in there at quarterback he's been mighty Purdy. No doubt. <laughs> Nicely done. Like I gotta give like a hat that. tip to Virginia Matt. I mean they knock off Miami. That's a huge yeah. win for them inside the ACC as well getting those guys to you believe. Want to about, you want to talk about bad quarterback play? I think there's six total interceptions, no touchdowns thrown yeah, all day. Yeah, it was bad, it especially was the first It was not great for either half. team. Yeah. I mean, I think Miami had three between their two quarterbacks. Virginia had three. But listen, you got to win those ugly ones sometimes. Miami couldn't figure it out. And then, like you yeah. said, great win for, for Virginia. Absolutely, great win for Virginia. And on the flip side of those losses, there were some big wins. And you just touched on mm -hmm. one. Georgia went down, the number two team in the nation, to an outside the top 10 team. They were 13th ranked LSU at the time. LSU blasted Georgia, 36 to yeah. 16. Now they're back in the top five. The Tigers are ranked number five and Matt I gotta ask you this question because I was a punter and I was a holder I know you did some holding as well so yes. you would be involved in the installation of a fake punt or a fake kick that and you mentioned situational football earlier as well I would go straight to a quarterback if we're talking about <laughs> situational football that fake field goal attempt in the first quarter oh. you would have thought aliens landed in my living room when I saw that happen I had no idea what was going on I thought they were just going to tie the game up 3-3 and get ready for a heavyweight fight can you ever remember installing a fake field goal and the coach saying, if we get it first look, we're running it? Yeah, I can, but we didn't get the look. Yeah. So we, called, <laughs> we made the check and got out of it. But uh, when you have those things, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those hit or miss. Yeah. You're either going to get it and you're going to score or you're going to, you know, get stuff behind the line of scrimmage. So it's, it's uh, you can't be right. I mean, it. But at that point in the game, you don't call that. Yeah, exactly. You just tie the game yeah. up What's and move the upside? on. You're, you're, you're on the road. You're, yeah, you're on the road. Take points on the Get road em. against a great defense, loud environment. Get as many points. Because we know LSU's offense wasn't going to be yes. super. I mean, they scored. They had two turnovers, got them great field position. And then the momentum of that game just started to favor LSU. But you got to knock the crowd out of that football Absolutely. game. And then make LSU drive the entire field without confidence from their defense. So I, I, I hated the call. And know your personnel. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> no one no, thinks you fine, really want to yeah. run. I mean, you would have a kicker run 30 yards. Because, I mean, it, they're on the, what, the 10-yard line, so he's backed up to the yeah. six. Running at an angle is like 25, 30 yards. And that's the safety from LSU that they're comparing to Minka Fitzpatrick. Yeah, I mean, I, like, I think uh, Rodrigo's the best kicker in America, but you're going to lose that fight. You're going to lose man. that fight, man. <laughs> that's a tough look. But another team that you've been really high on all season and a player that's playing at a very high level had another big win. Oregon beat Washington. Justin Herbert, he's putting himself in there for some Heisman talk. Oh, I mean, you got to go back. When people look at this Oregon team right now, obviously you go back to the Stanford loss, a game they should have won. They oh, were man. dominating. Uh, silly fumble at the inside line, just get under center. And they, I mean, literally, if they got under center in a QB sneak, or if the running back doesn't fumble the ball towards the end of the game, we'd be talking about Oregon possibly the number three team in yeah, the country right absolutely. now. I mean, this team, I think, is very good. Obviously, beating Washington this week is huge for them in their program. Now they're really the team in the Pac 12. So I like them. I like Oregon. I think that was a big win. Uh, excited. I think the bigger win, though, for me was the Michigan game. Yeah, absolutely. It's not just beating Wisconsin, but the way they beat Wisconsin. Dominating. Shea Patterson's playing great. That team has a lot of confidence right now. And what I tell you last week, don't put the ball in Hornybrook's hand. Yeah, they don't did Don't put that. it in Hornybrook's hand. Ideal. I would rather have Jonathan Taylor run the ball 40 times, and that would give them a better chance to win. Hornybrook threw two picks. Their offense did not look great for Wisconsin, and, and Michigan dominated that football game. So, Matt, are you buying into Michigan, Coach Harbaugh? I mean, I know he's got Shea Patterson. The defense playing pretty well, but I still have questions about the Wolverines. I do, too, and I, I think their defense is great. Yeah, they can, he can get a lot of talent on that side of the football and have them play good. He always has a running game. Their, their, their running attack has been really good. Yeah, he has Shea Patterson now, and, and he can do a little bit outside the pocket, on the move, create some big plays. but. Thing that I'm missing from Michigan is the ability to just drop back when they have to and throw the football. Yeah. And and a, with a coach like that and his experience in the NFL and the, his ability to go out and recruit, yeah, you got to be able to find those players and not make it so hard on yourself. I feel like when you watch Michigan, like the Wisconsin, I feel like they made it so hard on themselves and they still scored 38 mm -hmm. points. Yeah, it's great, but there's some games where you're just scratching your head, like who's this team out there? Like they, they don't look like Michigan, and I, I credit that to. To him, not getting the players that he, he should be getting and developing them. I mean, that's one of the main things as a college coach is you got to be able to recruit and then develop those guys into the type of players that you need them to be and they can fit your program. Yeah, develop those players the way you need them to be, but also develop consistency, yeah. which has been something that's yeah. really plagued Coach Harbaugh at Michigan. Watch out for that game this weekend. We're going to talk about it in a bit, but Michigan versus Michigan State. On the road. I know. On that the road. could be interesting. Let's talk about the college football playoff rankings, though. They are a couple weeks away. It seems like the top three are pretty clear. Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson. That fourth spot, though, man, it's, it's clear. up for grabs. No, it's not. Who are you going you with? You know who I'm going you with. Anyway. You're wearing your green anyway. I'm wearing my lucky green right now. for uh, It's Notre Dame, man. I don't know. I know they had a close one. They beat Ball State by how much? Eight uh, points? I don't care. I was going to say that. It was like Ball State, <laughs> Vandy, care. and Pitt. They barely beat. <laughs> Listen, a win's a win's a win. We ain't going to worry about that. You can't tell me the way their defense is playing. I like Ian Book. I mean, one of his picks, the guy tipped his arm, ball popped his snare, interception in the red zone. I still think this is a very good team, run team with him at quarterback, and then we know what they can do defensively. I think Notre Dame's a team at that fourth spot. Do they have some tough games ahead of them? Yes, but I think they should be favored, and I think they'll have a legitimate chance to win each one of those. Matt, who's your fourth team? You know, I, I do think Notre Dame is a good pick. I'm not going with them, but I do like what they're doing with Ian Book. I think he gives them an opportunity to – the way he can throw the football and, and sling it around, I do like their offense now with him in there. But I'm going with LSU. Yeah. I got to mm -hmm. say, their team, after what they did against Georgia, beating them like they did, um, if their quarterback, Burrow, can do what he did against Georgia consistently for the rest of the season, they're going to be hard to beat with that defense and their run game. The only issue – I mean, I would – wins-wise, i got to go with LSU too. The only thing I, that concerns me is – the first rankings, like you said, you're at the beginning of the show, are going to be, I think, in two weeks. Yeah. So that's after the Alabama LSU Correct. game. Yeah. So, I mean, if they win that game, put Watch them up out. there. Yeah. Put them, at, put them up there. That's and, a good and, point. Yeah. And I think it could be, I mean, it's going to be at LSU. It's going to be noisy. That yeah. place is going to be, I think it's going to be shaking. The, 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 the stadium may fall down. It's going to be <laughs> that exciting to be at that ball game. So, I wouldn't put it past their defense to make it a fun football game. We always know that game is played pretty tough. Yeah, you guys both said LSU, and I agree with you. LSU's resume right now, surefire. If yes. it was today, yes, they'd be today. number four. But what about UCF? No love for the defending you know what, national champions? You know what? I would love to see UCF continue to climb, but you can't tell me that when, when it comes to push comes to stuff, yeah. at the end of the year, if they're undefeated, 
And the thought is Alabama's one and you put them at four. <laughs> How embarrassing that would be for college football. Yeah. It would not or, be good. Or would, it, or would that be the, the committee's opportunity to say, hey, to settle the all score. you group yeah. of five teams, you think you're that good? Okay, you have a chance to prove it right now. And I think Alabama would win that game 70 to nothing. <laughs> 70 to nothing? It would be. No hyperbole? <laughs> no. You're, you're signing that one off? You know Nick Saban saying, okay, you think you're national champs? You want to take I agree with part you of that. our championship last year? They would destroy that UCF team. They it would, would be really would be, yeah, They would be they a would. statement game for Alabama. That would certainly be a statement. And that would really answer if UCF is a pretender or a contender. And there's a few teams out in college football right now that have been making some noise, getting some big wins, and then they kind of fall off for a few weeks. A couple teams I have in mind. Texas, obviously they got the big win against Oklahoma, but lost to Maryland. Iowa State, they just beat West Virginia. But if they're like Iowa State that I expect them to be, they'll probably finish, I don't know, 8-5 and five this yeah. season. And then Florida. I mean, what is Florida? We're going to find out. They got a bye week this week and then that big Georgia-Florida game in Jacksonville. I, I like Florida. It's, it's, we knew what they could do with Dan Mullen. I mean, he's such a tremendous coach. The, the question wasn't defense. The question was the offensive line, can they protect? Yeah. Can, they, can they get a run game going, which they've been able to do for the majority of the season? And can Felipe Franks just be consistent? He doesn't need to be great. It's just no, like it's just like is the yeah. answer. <laughs> Well, he's he been saw consistent. this last weekend. He's, he's been consistent. I mean, he Turned had a the ball over. He had two touchdowns, one pick. The pick, I, it's like the Seattle call. You're at the one-yard line. You're dominating the run game. People everywhere. And you throw a slant. There's just so many bodies right there in the end zone. I, I hated that call. I think they should have just run it three times and they would have scored a touchdown. Absolutely. I think he's playing better, though. He, and I, he I, certainly I, is. And I think it's just like Burrow at LSU. You understand when you have a great defense, end a possession with a kick. Yeah. Punt, field goal, extra point make the opponent drive the entire field against your team, who has a great defense in Florida, like I said, a great defense yes. in LSU. I think it, he's learning that now, and that's why you've seen him take care of the football a little bit better. And the drive and the kick. I think I've successfully brainwashed you. You have brainwashed Good me. Good job. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. As week eight approaches, though, there's a lot of rumblings on which coaches are on the hot seat. Some teams are not really playing that well. One especially in this area where we're filming in, in Atlanta, Georgia, Gus Malzahn, just an hour and a half down the road at Auburn. Auburn's four and three. They are sixth place in the SEC uh -huh. West right now. Now he just got nearly a $50 million contract extension before the season started. Is there any way they would buy him out, Matt? I think the number's $38 million. <laughs> no, no, I don't think they're buying him out. No, not this year. And it's too early, you know, he's, he's fine. He's fine. Now, Again, don't mess up the rest <laughs> yeah, of the exactly. season. You know, keep that three at the end of your record, and and you know, which I don't think they are. Though they got to play Georgia and Alabama as the, the big they do. kicker. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and you know, once the and like Matt said, keep that three there. If things start going even farther south in the SEC, I'd be willing to say that money is not the biggest problem. So thirty-eight is a big problem. You just be you'd be surprised. Thirty-eight is a big. Heading problem. across the country though, Clay Helton at USC. He's USC, fine. you think he's, he's fine. fine as well? He's, he's, a, fine. he's four he's and a, two. He's a 17, 18 year old quarterback right now. He's yeah. four and two. But he's playing. He's decent. a young quarterback. He's not yeah. playing bad. All right, what I about got, Bobby Petrino at Louisville. Bobby yeah. Petrino at Louisville. They're two and five. They're seventh the, in the ACC. Atlanta. The worst Power Five team that go with Arizona right now in college football. I mean, they are really bad but they, the thing is the buyout once again i think they came out and said we can't afford to buy him out yeah. talk about confidence for your coach we want to fire you <laughs> but, we can't. but we can't afford to fire you it's like, called having a really that, good agent that's, that's what it's called yeah as a head coach i feel really good about myself like thanks for the vote of confidence for the rest of the season so. i'd call my agent i'd take him out to dinner for Seriously. sure Seriously, he's, gotta, he's go gone yeah. I, I think petrino he's he needs he's gonna go it's gonna be whether it's they can't the, afford it though they'll find a way <laughs> <And> they <laughs> exactly. said they literally said this week we can't afford to fire him. in the off season <laughs> they'll find a way they'll some so. boosters are the, the, the program's <laughs> going to go to Churchill Downs this offseason, yes. win some money on the horse race, and they're going to get him out of there. <laughs> All right, well, you just saved me from my believe it. I'll go with Bobby Petrino. <laughs> gets fired before the season even ends. I got one name, though, before we get in to our week eight in midseason superlatives. Scott Frost at Nebraska. They are 0-6. Simmer down. Now, I know he is the prodigal son. I know he is Mr. Nebraska, played quarterback yep. there, won a national championship there. Just think about this scenario, though. Think about this. That's like having Peyton Manning coach Tennessee, and they start off 0-7, and they're not winning a game. What do you say? Like, oh, well, I mean, this is our guy. We just got to roll with him. It, they haven't won a game. Yeah, but look at their team last year. They weren't very good last year in Nebraska. I mean, he was inheriting a team that had a lot of growing up to do. We talked about the quarterback position. He, he names Martinez the quarterback. Everyone else transfers, and all of a sudden, you have a freshman walk-on who's your starter for the first part of the season. I mean, you, it's a bad situation being yeah, coach there in Nebraska. 
I like him, man. I, I was watching game day this weekend, and he was talking. And I texted you. I was like, I would run through a wall for that guy. I mean, he is a great football coach. I think he's, he's a great motivator. He's a guy who's been there. He's done that. I think he'll be fine. Give him some time. And, and like I said, this isn't – it's not like he inherited Florida who has a bunch of talent, yeah. you know, where he said no to Florida. He went to the Nebraska where he knew it was going to be harder. But it's home from him, and, and I guarantee you he's going to do whatever it takes to make sure that program – is going to get on the right track going forward. You said you'd run a wall through him. I bet you that he would run run through a wall to have you be scored one of us <laughs> right now because they don't have anything yeah. going on. But let's talk about some people that do have it going on, and we're going to talk about some mid-season superlatives right now. I want to know who the most valuable player in college football is through seven weeks. I, I got to go Justin Herbert at Oregon right wow. now. Okay. I, I think that team we know historically defensively, Oregon's not great, and they're still not that great this year. They've played some some good games, Stanford. They played well defensively for the majority of that football game. First Washington, they played well, but Washington's had their struggles offensively. So I got to go with him. I think he's the most exciting player. If I'm a GM, I'm taking him. I mean, I was watching the game this weekend, and John Elway's up in the in the box watching the game. Just love it. And John Elway's, <laughs> I mean, the, the smile on his face the entire game. I'm just like, he's, he's picking it. Yeah. He's getting ready. I mean, he's, he's getting ready. He's maneuvering away to get to get the Broncos in the top five. If they, I mean, they will be in the top five the way they're playing right now. Um, so I like him so far. I think he means so much. I think he's a Heisman guy and, and should be the first quarterback taken next year's draft. I'm going with Tua in Bama. Uh, you know, he's making their offense look like something they haven't seen mm -hmm. in all these years of their dominance in college football. Their ability, I mean, how many times has he thrown a touchdown in the first play of the game? Yeah, I think I've come out, come out of meetings on Saturday night and I'm like, oh, it's 20 seconds in the game, it's 7 <laughs> nothing, Bama. So, you know, that dimension to their team, being able to throw the football whenever they want, you know, that's, that's special. No doubt. Now, can you remember playing with a player or having success like that on your own? I mean, I know 2009 was a special year for you. Have you ever been around a guy who's just been untouchable through a 7-10 week stretch? Yeah, when I was with Houston, uh, Andre Johnson, you know, being having a guy like that, a security blanket that, you know, he was going to make you look good no matter where you put it. You know, that, I remember there was probably um, a month straight where he had about 130 plus receiving yards. I mean, just the production and dominance with roll coverage, two man coverage, and he was finding a way to beat it. You know, it's stuff that you don't see. And, you know, but from a guy like him or a Julio Jones, mm -hmm. those, those guys, um, he was, he's a special player. No doubt. And I think a special player for me, and we're talking about most valuable player, oh, a player that's bringing value <laughs> to his team through seven weeks, it's Joe Burrow. And, and that might be low-hanging fruit because he just beat up on Georgia. But if you take Joe Burrow off that LSU team and kind of put the quarterbacks that they've had on LSU the past couple seasons, I don't know if they're going to be the top five ranked team that they are. I don't know if they beat Auburn. I don't know if they beat Georgia. Joe Burrow, and I have not been his biggest fan, now I am. I'm a believer, and I think you are the most valuable player through seven weeks of college football. And then I'll just go right into my most surprising team. Uh -huh. I got to go LSU. Again, these guys are proving it every single week. I've been doubting them. They continue to prove me wrong. And look, they deserve to be a top five ranked team. And we're going to find out what they're really about when they welcome Alabama in a couple weeks. I got to go with Iowa State right now. Obviously, we saw the big low-hanging fruit right here for me, too. As soon as they put Purdy in there at quarterback, I mean, this is an offense I was getting 14 points, 10 points, 3 points. You change the quarterback up, all of a sudden you get 48 points yeah. against Oklahoma State. You get 30 points this past weekend versus West Virginia, a big win against the number six team in the country. I, who knows how good they do the rest of the season, but they have turned the tide a little bit. Things are moving for them offensively. They're playing well defensively. They just need to make sure they wear those black jerseys every week, and I think they'll be good to go. <laughs> I have to go with Kentucky. Uh, just the fact that we're even saying that they're ranked in college football. I mean, it's not basketball season yeah. yet. That doesn't start for another month. Um, them getting to 5-0 and before they suffered their first loss, um, you know, I think, to me, that's a big surprise. Absolutely, and we're talking about surprises. If you go on the opposite side of that and think about disappointments, I've already mentioned Nebraska. I mean, to me, with Scott Frost and the success he had a year ago, I know you mentioned the injuries and how much they're dealing with that and all the transfers that happened beforehand. So I will not double down and say that they are my most disappointing team. I'm just going to go back to a, a division that you were loving in preseason. This just, is the Big just, Ten East. Yeah. I mean, the Big Ten East has not really proven what everybody was saying that they were going to be through seven weeks. Michigan State hasn't looked that good. Penn State, not as consistent as you want to see them. 
However, Michigan. if Michigan State beats Michigan this weekend, then the Big Ten East is just in shambles. Yeah, it, it's done. It's, it's been a rough, rough year for those guys. I mean, like you said, I was high on them. Yeah, I think a lot of people were. I mean, you look at the talent that conference was bringing back, that East was just loaded, and uh, they've been subpar. I mean, Michigan's playing well right now. Well, obviously, Ohio State's up there, number two team. But other than that, the Michigan State and, and the Penn State have not been what people were expecting. So that's disappointing. For me, disappointing, though, I, I got to go with Miami. And I'm sorry, yeah. Coach Rick. Yeah. I love you, Coach Rick. I'm but, glad you said that after they lost to my Cavaliers. Yeah. You know, just making you know, them some disappointments now. Yeah. I mean, you go into that game versus LSU. I mean, obviously, we know LSU now, but – they got crushed by LSU first game of the season, and then obviously the loss to Virginia. And, and the quarterback plays, which most disappointing for me at Miami, Coach Rick, known from his time at FSU to Georgia, yeah, absolutely. of great quarterback play. It's just been super inconsistent, especially with a second-year quarterback, then a young kid uh, that you're expecting to be pretty good. You go and throw three picks total versus for Virginia, and then, like I said, the inconsistency all year long at that position. That has me worried about Miami and the, and the direction they're heading the rest of the season. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking at two teams here, and it was hard for me to decide between Auburn, number one, you know, with their expectations coming in the year, and now they're sitting at four and three, and then Florida State. Yeah, that's a good You pick. know, with Willie Taggart coming in and just all the talent that's there. I mean, they have quarterbacks there. They have two guys that have played football at a high level. There's no reason for you to be sitting at three and three, I believe, is what their record is, and uh, that's inexcusable. And the way they're losing football games, I mean, in the ACC, you think of two teams, at Florida State and Clemson right away. Yeah, and for sure. And when Florida State's not in that equation at this point in the season, I mean, that's bad. Yeah, the, the kind of dumpster fire it is, if you will, yeah. with Willie Taggart in his first season there. I know Florida State alumni aren't happy. I know fans aren't happy, and it's been interesting in Tallahassee, to say the least. That's been a big-time storyline. Let's think about the best storyline through seven weeks, and I'll take it right off the bat. I'm going with that red shirt rule. The new red shirt rule oh. in college football has caused <laughs> some shakeups, some players transferring before the season is even over. That Kelly Bryant deal at Clemson, man, it muddied the waters big time. Then Trevor Lawrence gets hurt. I think that is one that's going to change the entire landscape of college football. And for me, it's my best storyline so far. I think for me is, is UCF. I mean, they had a big win this weekend versus Memphis. They survived. They're undefeated. If they go undefeated for a second trade season, I mean, they're not sneaking up on anyone now. They're on everyone's radar. People are talking about them. They're in the top 10. Yeah. If teams start losing, and they start continuing to win and creeping up, could we see them somehow get into the final four? I mean, will the committee vote them in to one, prove that, hey, you can make it, and then two, to prove that, yeah, you can make it, but you ain't gonna survive long if you <laughs> play Alabama. So that's gonna be interesting to kind of look at because obviously their schedule with their talent is pretty cupcake going forward. I think they got a big game, I believe, for Cincinnati, who's undefeated right now, and then yep. they also have to play USF. Uh, at the end of the season. So those are two big games versus two currently undefeated teams. If they take care of business as they should, uh, it's going to be interesting because we know teams always somehow find a way to lose towards the end of the year uh, in these big conferences. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to have to go with who's going to who's fighting for second place yeah you know no one's going to be able to compete with bama right now and uh, is anyone going to be able to come within three scores of them and i think everyone's fighting for second place right now unless something drastic happens to that bama football team it is crazy just because how bama's offense has performed under nick saban and then Tua tongo Valoa has the great second half versus georgia last year in the national championship game there was a bit of a controversy who's going to start leading into 2018 and then when they named two of the starter i've said this uh, probably 10 times on the show, Herb Street goes on, Matt, and says they're going to score 45 to 50 a game. And I go, okay, I mean, come on. Could you even imagine that? I mean, they are scoring at will, and it's yeah. every single week inside the SEC. Yeah, I mean, every, every week you look at halftime, and it's like 42 nothing, 49 nothing. You're just like, all right, well, let's see what they're like when it's a close game in the fourth quarter. You know, when I was – They even made it to the fourth quarter. I mean, exactly. Issue, can these guys, when it's fourth quarter, look up like – we're still in the game. They're, they're, <laughs> we're not on the bench. They're cutting their tape, yeah. taking their gloves yeah. off. They're just no, they're hanging out. Back in there. It's, some flower seeds. Going. It's crazy. I mean, it is a run in college football that it's we crazy. haven't seen in yeah. some time. But let's look to week eight. And Alabama's going to take care of business against Tennessee this week. You sure we'll you don't want to pick Tennessee again? You sure? <laughs> Double down, right. Drew. Hey, come on now. Double I down, you, Drew. I gave you a winner. I gave Drew's you a actually winner. walking away from the table. <laughs> <laughs> 
In the Big Ten, a big game. Number six, Michigan goes to number 24, Michigan State. Michigan is a touchdown favorite here. They, of course, had the big home win in the night game, college game day against Wisconsin just a week ago. But you kind of saw their true colors week one against Notre Dame. Michigan State beats Penn State. I mean, this is shaping up to be a game that can really shake up the college well, football Well, I think playoff. the good thing for Michigan is the fact that Michigan State beat Penn State. So now they're they're a little bit more alert. Yeah. If Penn State went into that ball game yeah. and absolutely dominated Michigan State and Michigan State looked like the team we've seen for the majority of the year, then I think Michigan's mindset would be, yeah. they ain't anything, they've had a rough year, we're dominating, we're on a roll. I think that woke them up to this week saying, hey, if we don't go out there and ball out, if we don't prepare the way we need to prepare, look what they did to Penn State, they can come and do that to us as well. So listen, I still like Michigan, I like Shea Patterson, I like their defense, they're giving up like 16 points a game. Uh, so I think they're going to play a great game. I think it's going to be a close game. I still yeah. am a believer that this Michigan State football team is a good football team. Yeah. It's at home. We know what these games at home mean to these programs. So it's going to be exciting. But like I said, I got Michigan. I think the momentum is still there for that football team. Do you believe that, though? Like, okay, LSU lost to Florida, so they kind of had their backs against the wall, and they right. come out and play a great game against Georgia. Michigan State beats Penn State last week. Do you think that kind of woke Michigan up, and they're going to have to come out and bring their best? Yeah, I think I think it is a wake-up call. I think uh, everyone in the locker room, in your prep all week, that's what you're thinking about. You don't want to have that feeling in the locker room after a game again. Yeah. And I, th I like Michigan this week against Michigan State. It, also, it's your in-state rival. Yeah. It's, they're an hour and a half down the road. A lot of these guys are from up there. They know each other. You don't want to lose to your in-state in -state rival, and, and they're going to take care of business. I'm going with Michigan State. I really am. There Coach Harbaugh does not have a good record against Michigan State or Ohio State, and I just have not seen the consistency as a whole during his tenure at Michigan. I'm sure it's going to be cold. I'm sure the weather is going to be brutal. This game is at noon, you know so Michigan, 11 a.m. They, they deal with the cold every day I understand that. <laughs> I don't think that's an issue But for I'm thinking team. fumbles. I'm thinking interceptions, sloppy football. Yes. It's going to be close, but I think Michigan State pulls a huge win out here, and Connor Hayward from Peachtree Ridge High School had a touchdown pass as a running back last there week. Go. He'll be the X factor for sure. In the <laughs> ACC, two unbeatens are taking care of each other here. NC State, the number 16th ranked team in the nation, is going to Clemson, the number three ranked team in the nation. I had to look, and I'm like, holy cow, NC State's undefeated. They've just been playing in the ACC. Their schedule's so weak, nobody's uh, giving them any wow. love. This is crazy. Wow. And, uh, sorry, man. Come on, wow. sorry. I mean, even their at a conference game, I mean, I covered NC State when they played Marshall. I mean, they just ro ran right through them. And, and uh, NC State's defense is playing well. It's a young yeah. defense, but they're playing well because they haven't played anyone. Listen, I like Clemson. I think they're, they're just more talented than this, this NC State team. But I do like Finley, the quarterback yes. for NC State. Absolutely. He's getting a lot yes. of love. I mean, well. you look at all the quarterbacks that are going to be in the draft this year. I would take him and I would take him top two, top three round kind of guy. I mean, he's that good anticipation, his accuracy, his touch. I mean, he checks off every single box you want to check out for a quarterback. And what has Clemson struggled with? They've, they've struggled against teams that could pass the ball. They're secondary. We know how good they are at the front four. We know how good they are at the front seven. It's when teams want to go vertical on them is yeah. when we've seen them struggle. So I think NC State can make some noise and have, make this a fun football game. And you never know with a freshman quarterback with Lawrence when yeah. that moment's going to happen where he looks like a freshman. And then, shoot, he's shown that he can get hurt. You know, if he goes down, you never know. I mean, they don't have that next guy up, which has been bugging me all year long. <laughs> So it will be a fun game, but it's crazy to me that currently the number two team in the ACC is a 17-point yeah, dog. Yeah, that's right? wild. It just shows you how weak the ACC is right now. Well, okay. Matt, this sorry, is you're my taking upset. shots right now. This, this, shots this, for this Matt is actually here. my upset this nice. week. Okay. I like okay. NC State because uh, they can throw it. Yep. Yeah. And I think Clemson has struggled offensively. And I think they've underwhelmed a little bit this year. And I think that they're – you know, there's question marks in the way, whether Trevor Lawrence can go in and, and produce for four quarters at a consistent level. And I think uh, NC State can score some points. If they can block that front yeah, that Clemson's going to throw yeah. at them and make some plays in the secondary, you know, I like them keeping it close into the fourth quarter and then finding a way to win. There were a lot of question marks around Trevor Lawrence. Clemson bounced back. They beat up on Wake Forest 63-3, to I believe the score was. But then they had a bye week. So maybe that momentum kind of got stalled out a little bit and they could be Wake set Forest, up for a big-time trap game. Wake Forest. All right. Well, I hope you're right because we'll replay that <laughs> clip and go viral. That will be <laughs> ideal. In the SEC, though, speaking of having your backs up against the wall and having to perform consistently, LSU has another big home game. Number 22, Mississippi State, is going into Tiger Stadium. LSU is now ranked number five. It's a night game. LSU is not even a touchdown favorite, just six and a half points. So what does that tell you? 
Is Vegas not even believing in Joe Burrow? I, I don't know. I mean, if I'm LSU, though, I'm not putting eight guys in the box. I'm going to put 11 guys in the box. Yeah. And, and say, Fitzgerald, if you got a guy like wide open, can you hit him out there? <laughs> because, I mean, he's just not an accurate quarterback. I mean, he can run the football. But if he has to win the game throwing it, it's just not going to happen for this Mississippi State team. I think that with those talented safeties and, and cornerbacks for LSU, they're going to play tight man, inside leverage, say if you're going to beat us, you're going to have to beat us on outbreaks, outside the hashes, or you're going to have to beat us on go balls. Can Nick Fitzgerald be accurate? I'm not a believer in it. I don't think it's going to happen. I think LSU's defense is too talented at home. I think it could be close just because of the fact Mississippi State's defense is good and they can keep them in the football game. But I think, I think, I think LSU can shut this team down pretty handily just from the fact it's going to be one-dimensional. Any chance LSU has kind of that letdown week after no. a huge win against Georgia? No, they're too good. They're too talented. I think they're going to go and take care of business. I, I'm going to pick them, you know, to cover. Yeah, I would agree, too. I think LSU takes care of business yep. here. Joe Burrow, I mean, he is my MVP through seven weeks of the season, but Coach Orgeron, I mean, Coach Orgeron outcoached Kirby Smart in Georgia last week. That's something that I probably would have never believed in, but it's exactly what happened, and Steve Ensminger, the offensive coordinator for LSU. Great job. He's been doing a fantastic job as well. So I think LSU keeps it rolling. They are laser focused for that Alabama game in just a few weeks. Speaking of Alabama, they're traveling to Neyland Stadium to take on Rocky Top. This is a great and historical SEC rivalry. It's at 3.30 p.m. Bama's a 29 point favorite, but if Tua doesn't play, they might take it off the board. Nobody knows what's gonna happen. Oh. Do you bench Tua? You know, I think it depends on how severe his yeah. injury really is. I mean, I don't know how many. I mean, there's probably three people that know how bad it is. For Tua, sure. Saban, and the trainer. I mean, yeah. That's it. But um, I'd probably rest him. You know, give him some time because they have their bye coming up. Yeah. And then let him come back for the stretch run. But um, they're going to take care of business against Tennessee. So if you do rest him, one yeah. thing that you mentioned earlier in the show is that you were questioning if one team could come within three scores. If Jalen Hurts still is cover the starter, so they'll the still cover that. All right. What do you think about this game? you got to you got to bench Tua. I mean, boo-hoo, you have to play a quarterback who's – And a bye week next week. Yeah, you, you have to play a quarterback who's, what, 27-2, and two, led you to two national championships. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, just put him in. It's okay. I mean, it's – it's it's uh it's great problems to have if you're an Alabama fan. Yeah. If you're Alabama, I mean, you just put in Jalen, who's actually done a great job this year. I mean, his ability to throw the football has surprised a lot of people. I mean, he really has taken that next step forward with his accuracy in the past game. Why risk to uh, re-aggravating something? I mean, you give them this week off, they got a bye week, so you pretty much get three weeks of no contact before you play LSU. I mean, yeah. right now that game is the game of the year no for doubt. Alabama. I, I, you got to rest him. I mean, you're going to roll through Tennessee. I mean, Garantano is going to have to have a game of his life to keep it close. Okay. So, Let me ask you guys yeah, this. Please. With Jalen Hurts, were you surprised that he opted to stay? I loved it. I loved it because I were, think, You weren't surprised? No, I was surprised in the fact that I thought as soon as Kelly Bryant transferred, I thought Jalen might transfer the next day. Right. Because at that point, Kelly Bryant's already taken official visits. He wants to be that number one guy. Jalen Hurts committed to his team. Again, won a national championship with these guys. 28 and 27 and two as a starter. I couldn't believe that Kelly Bryant transferred. He started 18 games in a row, won an ACC championship. Going. I, and they just left this team. He got some news that he didn't like and he left his team. He, Why in the middle but, of the but, season? But, okay, once again, he only has one year to play. This I is understand that. Yeah. Jalen can play this year. And Jalen, in Jalen's mind, I think he's thinking. Dabo said he wouldn't play him. I don't know. Yeah, but how about if Trevor gets hurt? Just Dabo like he said did. he wouldn't play him. Uh, I don't know. When it comes to, we're, we're about to lose a, a chance to go to the championship. I agree. We need him. He's putting him in that football game. I guarantee it. Jalen has another chance. I think Jalen's thinking, I don't need two years to go somewhere and play. Yes. I just need one year. Yes. That's all I want. Yeah. I've been in college enough. I get to be on the greatest team of all time. Yes. I get to win an, another national championship. So I get I win two national championships. I've been the three. And then I get to go start somewhere else for a year and then go on and do whatever I want from there. I think that's his mindset. And I think the plan for him has been great so far. I mean, he's getting a lot of playing Thanks. time. And I think, and, and I had a discussion earlier today, their plan with the two quarterback system has been 10 times better than Georgia's plan. Oh, Georgia's plan. I mean, awful. Georgia's yeah. plan. There is no those, plan. There is no, it's, yeah. oh, Go in for one play, okay, you're out. Yeah. Go in for one play, you're out. If you're going to use them, use them in the red zone. Use them in third down. Have a package that you work all week so it's not confusion on the sideline of when's he going in, yeah. when's he not. I mean, the uncertainty for Fromm of right. at what moment am I getting taken out of the game. It's yeah. not set where Alabama's plan is set, and that's why Alabama's so good. I know. It starts with the coaching. They have a plan 
for every situation. And right now, Georgia has had no plan for their quarterback situation. And it's, it's honestly driving me crazy. What were your thoughts <laughs> on Kelly Bryant? Yeah. Up and left his team. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't surprised. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you got to, at the end of the day, I understand you're part of a team. You're part of that locker room and all those guys. You come in together, you, you, you know, work NFL. out and all that stuff. But you also have to look at what's going to help me try to pursue dreams that I have and aspirations. So it's a double-sided yeah. coin. But I, I don't blame him for wanting to do it. I mean, he was the guy, and he took that team. And then all of a sudden, no, it's not yours anymore. And, you know, it's, it's hard to battle back from that. So I don't blame him for wanting to leave and get a chance. Double-sided coin, probably the best way to put it for sure. Going back to the Alabama-Tennessee game, if Jalen Hurts does start, I just think it'll be surprisingly close. Look at what Georgia was able to do against Jalen Hurts last year. Jeremy Pruitt was a defensive coordinator of Alabama just a year ago. He knows this personnel. He knows exactly where to put his guys on defense to make sure Jalen doesn't have a lot of success. On the other side of the ball, though, with the offense against Alabama's defense, who knows? But uh, I think, yeah, you move it down to 21. and have You can put guys in position action. to make a play, but you still have to defend no doubt. You still, you still have, have to make to. a play. No doubt. Last game here as we're wrapping up, number 12, Oregon traveling to number 25, Washington State. This is a Pac-12 North battle. Washington State, two-and-a-half point home favorite Ooh. against your boy Justin Herbert. What's the over-under points The over-under 66 and a oh, half. Oh, I'm taking the A. Hot take of the week. Take the over. This game is going to be a lot of points. I mean, there may be 110 passes thrown in this game. Yeah. I mean, we know Washington State, they're not mm -hmm. going to run the football. I mean, they think they had a game this year where they didn't run the football. I mean, it was just pass the after anti pass. anti-Georgia Tech. Pass. It is the anti-Tech, <laughs> anti-Air Force. <laughs> So, I mean, it's going to be a lot of passes, a lot of points. Uh, I got Oregon, though. I think they're playing confidently right now. I, I don't see Washington State stopping Oregon's offense. So, I, I like – I like the Ducks, baby. Yeah, with a victory, Oregon's kind yeah. of a clear leader in that Pac-12 North. Yeah, I like Oregon going up there and getting a win. Unless they do something, turn it over three, four times and make it life easy for Washington State, I think Oregon will take care getting of Getting the shotgun guys. at the one-yard line. <laughs> yeah, make a decision. I, I, hopefully they got those mistakes out of their system. Yeah, Mario Cristobal, named to watch for Coach of the Year if Oregon continues yep. on the trend that they are on. But Week 8 is right around the corner. We are fired up to see what – goes down in college football. Matt, thanks so much for yeah. joining us here thanks on Campus Lord Live. That was a lot of fun. Aaron, it's okay. As usual, I got to put up with you. No, that was a lot of fun. And for everybody, I want you guys to know that if you are in Atlanta, Georgia, you've got to check out the College Football Hall of Fame. Regardless of what team you follow, you check in and the entire experience is bespoke exactly for you and your fan allegiance. So check out the College Football Hall of Fame here in Atlanta. You will not Regret it and check us out again next week. Thanks for tuning in to Campus Lore Live.